Welcome to another LSE Ideas Russia-Ukraine Dialogue. Today we'll be focusing on international crimes, including war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. For context, on the 2nd of March, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court opened a full investigation into past and present allegations of war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide committed in Ukraine by any person starting 21st of November 2013 onwards. The prosecutor has also set up an online method for people with evidence to initiate contact with investigators, and the ICC sent a range of professionals to Ukraine to begin collecting evidence. Uh, meanwhile, organizations like Bellingcat, Associated Press, and Frontline are also working hard to mine online information, data, and images emerging in Ukraine that could ultimately help to prosecute those who commit atrocities. A few days ago, Ukraine has started its first war crimes tri trial since the February escalation. It involves a Russian soldier who stands accused, accused of killing an unarmed civilian. Since the February escalation, Putin's troops have unleashed relentless violence against the people of Ukraine and civilian infrastructure, such as houses, hospitals, schools, kindergartens, nuclear plants, historic buildings, and churches. There have been a number of allegations of forced deportations of thousands of civilians from Ukraine to Russia, systematic and massive sexual violence, and deliberate killing of Ukrainian civilians by members of the Russian forces. In some areas, Russian troops have allegedly even used cluster music, uh, munitions, a type of weapon that is prohibited by more than 100 states around the world. To discuss the issue of international crimes, I would like to welcome two very distinguished panelists. First, I'd like to welcome Professor uh, Gary Simpson, who has been the Chair in Public International Law at LSE since 2016. He previously taught at the University of Melbourne, the, Australia, the Australian National University, and LSE. He's also a very distinguished uh, uh, writer in, in his field. Uh, Professor Douglas Irwin Erickson is our second panelist. He's a, an assistant professor at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Reconciliation at George Mason University. He's all, also the author of Raphael Lemkin and the Concept of Genocide. All right, let's start first with Gary. Uh, can you distinguish for us between war crimes, crimes against humanity, and also the crime of aggression? And based on news, surfacing from the Russia-Ukraine war, are those crimes being committed in Ukraine? Thank you. Well, thank you, Leon, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, LSE Ideas. Um, it's great to be on this panel with, with uh, Douglas uh, to discuss this important um, issue. Um, so I guess the, 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 the best way to approach what is a rather complicated question is to make a distinction between two um, bodies of law, which are part of both international law and international criminal law, namely the law that applies to um, armed conflict and indeed non-armed conflict uh, when in train. And then secondly, the law that applies to decisions to go to war themselves. This is some um, international lawyers have got Latin uh, phrases for everything, but this is the distinction between the sort of use in bello, the law within war, the law of war, and use ad bellum, the law that applies to force, or we could call this Geneva and Hague law on one hand, and sort of UN uh, and New York City, San Francisco law on the other hand. And so in the case of, uh, in the case of Ukraine, we have sort of two, two genres of criminality, if you like. We've got the, the initial invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces and the Russian state, um, at the behest, we assume, of the Russian elite and, particular, uh, and particularly President Putin. And that falls within the broad category of the crime of aggression and um, by any standards looks very like the crime of aggression as defined in the Rome Statute, the Kampala Agreement, and of course the, uh, at the Nuremberg and Tokyo war crimes trials. But I can say more about that later. 
So the second broad um, um, tranche of, of crimes are the war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Now these tend to be acts or constituted by acts committed during war and they each differ in rather important ways. But broadly speaking, I think we've got fairly good evidence that um, war crimes are being committed in Ukraine um, by Russian forces. I mean, there were early allegations of, of criminality that to me felt as if they'd been made in bad faith by some of the Western powers. But now we're in a situation where we've got quite a lot of evidence of attacks on civilian populations, extra judicial killings and torture and so on. So um, one imagines that a war crimes um, prosecution uh, or many war crimes prosecutions could ensue as a result of these sorts of acts. Um, with crimes against humanity and in particular genocide ones in a much sort of muddier area, the, the, the burden of proof is greater. Um, the need to establish some form of intent on the part of the perpetrators is both important and very difficult in the case of genocide. And in the case of crimes against humanity, what we're looking at or looking for are sort of widespread or systematic attacks on civilian populations. We may indeed have that, but it would be harder, I think, to prove that that was the case. So that, that seems to be the current situation. Uh, we've got a lot of activity, of course, all sorts of institutions involved, all sorts of jurisdictions involved. It's not clear where people would be tried if they were tried. There seem to be at least three or four different fora um, in play at the moment. Excellent. Those are some great observations to kick off this discussion. Let's first turn to uh, Doug. Now, Doug, Raphael Lemkin, the father of the Genocide Convention, was adamant that we need to distinguish between genocide and crimes against humanity. Can you briefly differentiate between those crimes? And uh, do you think genocide is being committed by uh, Putin? And finally, what are your main observations regarding the genocidal intent? Thank you. Thank you, Leon, so much for this invitation. Um, as Gary said, I would like to just echo how uh, great it is to be here with the LSE Ideas Forum. Um, and it's really a pleasure to be here um, with, with, with you and, and thank you for organizing this. Um, you know, I, when you talk about the Lemkin and the differentiation between genocide and crimes against humanity, um, Lemkin in his, in, in between 1941 and 1948 uh, for sure, but then, then certainly to the end of his life, had many, many, many different, different definitions of these two ideas and he's changing all the time. And he's changing as a political winds blow. Um, and that's one of the complexities of him. I like to say there's a lemkin for everybody because, because so many different interest groups and diaspora groups and legal groups and cultural groups and social groups and professors, you can pretty much find something in lemkin um, that sort of speaks to your particular interests and needs um, and moments. So he's a great, he's a great shape shifter. But importantly, um, he originally defined genocide as a crime against humanity. That's really sort of an important part of the evolution of his thinking. He saw it as completing the sort of the, 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 what crimes against humanity was supposed to achieve. Um, and then as politics and law start to separate, he, he really does not like the Nuremberg tribunals. He calls them cowards. Um, he says that they could not escape their military origins because they had refused to take up this, um, this effort of crimes against the peace that he and Aaron Trainin, the Soviet jurist, had advocated, <clears throat> had advocated for. And he sees the separation of crimes against humanity um, in Nuremberg tribunals as actually as, as something that's actually quite, uh, he, well, he, he, he called it cowardly. Um, they, were, they wanted to, to, to prosecute a past Hitler so that they couldn't, uh, so that the, the military origins of the tri tribunal, he said, was intended to mask the, the, uh, the crimes against humanity that were being committed by the Western powers, the allied powers that had won the war. And, and that's, that's sort of echoed Jackson, Robert Jackson very clearly insists on the nexus to, with, uh, with armed conflict for crimes against humanity. And he says very openly that if we didn't do this, we would be prosecuted back home um, for these very crimes against our own minority populations. So Lemkin, Lemkin's an interesting person. Um, the ideas that he creates are very interesting and convoluted, but most importantly here is, I think, in this story <clears throat> is 
is that what you see around the UN uh, negotiations over the genocide uh, convention is that the definition of genocide begins to, to take on a very, very different meaning as nation states begin to negotiate what exactly this treaty is. So for instance, this begins around Nuremberg, where we have letters between Maxwell Fife and Lemkin, where Lemkin is saying to Maxwell, to, saying to Fife, why are you not prosecuting rape? Why are, he called it, it's an unfortunate euphemism that he used at the time, which was forced impregnation. Um, but that was a term that was used around that time to, to mean what we would now call rape. And a whole set of other gender defenses, uh, the payment, the German payments to women who were forced to bear children of German blood. Uh, forced marriages, and so forth. And so as Lemkin's writing these letters to, to Fife, um, insisting that they be prosecuted, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a tension there that they don't want to do that. And then that moves, that all those debates move into the UN. Um, and there's a moment there in the very openings of the UN where the women's leagues and the women's organizations pick up on Lemkin's terms. And Lemkin gets invited to these groups very early on. And and ultimately, they don't get anything they want in the convention, right? So the convention ultimately outlaws removal of children and forced, uh, forced prevention of birth, which, you know, could be adoption and so forth. But it doesn't outlaw things, the corresponding sort of gendered crimes, right? So they don't get everything. But Lemkin has this moment there where at the women's conventions, the women's organizations, he, he, he hooks up and he meets a network of women who are working within the Western delegations and the women who are representing, at the time, former colonies. So, the, the, so Pandit, the representative of the Indian delegation at the UN, um, that's where Lemkin meets her. And she becomes the fifth party, brings India on, which is still at this time a colony under colonial power for one more year, brings India on as the fifth signatory. And what they grab hold of is Lemkin's first definition of genocide, which is that genocide is a colonial crime with the intention of destroying the national patterns of the oppressed, and the imposition of the national patterns of the oppressor, period. Right, that's very different than what the treaty finally says. But that definition gathered all of the signatories of countries that were small states or former colonies. And they say in the contemporaries writings that their strategy is to force the US and the USSR to the bargaining tables and to bring along the UK and construct a strategy where they will allow the great powers to take credit for the law um, when they themselves were opposed to it. But you see over the next two years, an incredible, an incredible sort of political functioning that happens where the great powers are removing from the definition of the law the very things that they themselves are committing that would resemble genocide. And this is the reason why the U.S. doesn't ratify the convention until 89, is the U.S. Bar Association is saying, hey, you didn't do a good enough job negotiating this. We're still committing genocide against Native Americans, citizens of African descent on and on and on and on and on. So why is this crucial, right? This is crucial because Stalin is a co-author of the Genocide Convention, right? And we have all of the treaties in the Soviet archives. Anton Weisswent is the historian who has found them, where Vyshinsky and Stalin are underlining and they're blue in their red pencils, every single one of these lines. And they are writing this treaty in a way, and they will not sign this treaty in a way unless they feel that it cannot be held against their own treatment of their own domestic populations. Now, in 33, Lemkin had already been denounced as an enemy of the Soviet Revolution by Vyshinsky himself. Vyshinsky was Stalin's henchman. Um, he was, the, he was the, the lead prosecutor for all of Stalin's show trials, and he was the UN, rep, the UN ambassador for the USSR. And in 33, Vyshinsky had already denounced Lemkin as an enemy of the revolution for trying to, for, for the two books that he wrote in the 1920s, which was arguing that the Soviet penal code was using the force of the state towards the elimination of enemy nations within the Soviet Union that were enemies of the revolution. And then in 33, Lemkin writes his paper, Barbarity and Vandalism, two ideas that he synthesizes to coin the new word genocide late in the winter of 1941. So Vyshinsky's already got his sights on Lemkin in 33. And when that happens in the UN, that takes this up in the UN dipl diplomacy, what you see is the, the removal of these different kinds of atrocities from the definition of genocide. Now Lemkin ends his life thinking that, that the Genocide Convention is a failure. He writes in his memoir, right, all these, these, these really moving lines about the convention is now in the hands of statesmen who live in perpetual sin with history. But, the, but one of the, the sort of the, the reason why I'm going into this 
is that the very way that Putin talks about Ukrainian nationalism is the way that Stalin himself talked about Ukrainian nationalism. Because Vyshinsky and Stalin believed that they could not be prosecuted for genocide in Kazakhstan or Ukraine because these were not national groups. These were political groups. They were political groups for the creation of the West or they were economic groups. And, and <laughs> this, is, this is Putin's logic, right? Ukrainian nationalism is a fiction of Western politics and Western economy. And so what's interesting here is you might not be able to sort of prosecute this as genocide. Uh, there's a lot of legal loopholes that were written into this. There's a lot of, lot of, lot of double speak that happens with the protected groups in the law. But it, it becomes important when we're thinking of this in terms of the conflict. And I think that's, that's the interesting story to tell. Now, intent, intent is something that is, is a complicated um, process. I don't, I don't, I've taken more than my four minutes for each question. Um, but my, my sense is that, you know, that, that a lot of the things that, that Lemkin was talking about in genocide have become parts of crimes against humanity. And you might not get a genocide conviction or a genocide trial for all sorts of reasons, but that doesn't mean that, that, these, um, that, that these horrors and atrocities uh, go unpunished. And I think that's, that's sort of a crucial point to, to make. Okay, I've taken way over four minutes. I will thank you. Thank you, thank you Doug. Future. And thanks for the reminder also that, that there is a lot of overlap between genocide and crimes against humanity. Um, you know, those are all horrific crimes, you know, and, and to the victims, you know, it doesn't necessarily, you know, if, if they become victims, whether it's genocide or crimes against humanity, the result is the same. Um, now, Gary, let's go back to you. Uh, you mentioned earlier that jurisdiction over some of these international crimes that we talked about, um, it, it can be quite complicated. Can you talk to us about those complexities and, and, and maybe highlight also some of the, the, what we call the politics of international law? And what are the limitations of prosecution? Thank you. Uh, there's a lot in that question. Um, the politics of international law. Uh, I think maybe I should start with the, uh, the jurisdictional uh, question. And maybe it would be useful to go back to uh, where we've just been. Uh, and that, in that fascinating moment in the mid-century uh, when international criminal law became this sort of a uh, very vigorous political juridical project and in many ways uh, began to change the way we think and speak about war. So I, I think it's worth just pausing for a minute to, to, to know that uh, we're, in a, we're in an unusual historical moment. Uh, we are a generation that thinks that law and war belong together. Uh, and that hasn't always been the case. You know, we, we, we talk in the language of law and criminality when we're confronted with something like Putin's invasion of Ukraine. Um, but this is a relatively novel development in the history of warfare and the history of diplomacy. And I, I think it's worth marking both the benefits um, and also some of the vices associated with this, this particular move. And I can say a bit more about that when, when, we, when we talk about the politics of War crimes trials, but at Nuremberg, there's, there was a question about, and there always has been really a question about, you know, who has jurisdiction to prosecute um, individuals accused of committing war crimes. In in a way, there are there are sort of three broad categories of of place here. One is one is the idea of war crimes prosecution as a matter of territorial jurisdiction. That, so the most appropriate place to try any crime is in the place where that crime was committed. So this is a matter of sort of national sovereignty, as it were. And one can understand that the Ukrainian idea, Ukrainian claim that Ukraine is the place to try at least some of these uh, war crimes and possible crimes against humanity. That's where the evidence is, that's where the witnesses are, um, that's where the perpetrators um, are. And in a way, this goes back to Nuremberg. Uh, at least one argument is that the Allies were exercising, you know, old-fashioned territorial sovereignty over the German war criminals. They they were occupying Germany as the new sovereigns, and in a kind of collective sovereign act, they displaced Germany and exercised territorial sovereignty over Hermann Göring, uh, Kaltenbrunner, 
et al. So that's one form of, of jurisdiction. Um, a second is when um, states exercise something that's called universal jurisdiction, uh, which we've seen in the case of people like Adolf Eichmann, um, to a certain extent, um, Pinochet in London is an example of universal jurisdiction. And this is the idea that there are certain crimes that are so terrible that all states have competence to try them, um, either in absentia or more normally where the perpetrator you know, ends up in that state. So we've got the specter of, um, for example, Yugoslav war criminals ending up in, in say, Germany and being tried before local courts in in Frankfurt, or Adolf Eichmann, whose crimes were, of course, trans-geographical, trans-status. Um, um, they were, they were, they were committed all over Europe during that period, in, in, in from Hungary to Berlin to Auschwitz and so on. But Eichmann ends up getting prosecuted in a place where none of these crimes did take place, namely um, Jerusalem at the Jerusalem District Court, where the court exercises this form of sort of universal jurisdiction. So here we, we would imagine, say, a a Russian commander going on holiday to uh, Croatia or Scotland and ending up on, on trial at some point in, in the future. And then um, the third form of jurisdiction, and the one I think that we tend to be most familiar with, or at least we tend to connect most to the project of international criminal law, is of course international jurisdiction itself. The idea of setting up some sort of international court um, or uh, using a pre-existing international court. And of course, the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal is often described as the International uh, War Crimes Tribunal. After all, it was self-styled the International Military Tribunal. So uh, war crimes trials have this sort of basis in, in a combination of, sort of sovereign and international moves at Nuremberg. But in relation to this international effort, what we're seeing in... in um, in Ukraine is a kind of rehearsal of a very common uh, the dialectic that one finds in international law between what I think of as a kind of discretionary ad hoc preference for um, mechanisms sort of built for purpose and the idea of an ongoing permanent tribunal with jurisdiction over war crimes, war crimes wherever they're committed and this is this 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 combination has existed more or less right uh, from the beginning of the uh, war crimes trials era in let's say 1917 1918 but here in um, ukraine you see it in in microcosm with the proposals that putin be tried before a special tribunal uh, uh, constituted for the crime of aggression in ukraine i mean what could be more special what could be more discretionary what could be more ad hoc than that um, as against the idea that, or rather the regret, that the ICC doesn't have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression um, in Ukraine and couldn't prosecute Putin for um, aggression. That was something that was specifically excluded by many states, not just the Russians, but the United States as well and many of the Western, Western powers. So, um, and I'll just finish here. Uh, well, I think we should take up the, the politics of, of war crimes trials and maybe in a, even in a separate question. It's such a long topic, but, but I'll just sort of introduce it here. Um, one way to think about the politics of war crimes trials is that people tend to be hugely enthusiastic for war crimes trials when it comes to other states and very unenthusiastic about war crimes trials when they're applied uh, uh, at home. And maybe that's very predictable. But it flies in the face of the idea of international criminal law as a universalist Lemkinite project. So in many ways, there are two international criminal laws. There are the, there's the international criminal law one hears about in a slightly propagandist fashion in relation to Ukraine, where it seems unproblematic. We apply war crimes law, the law of crimes against humanity and genocide and aggression to um, this vile dictator. So that's one version, but the other version is a, is a story of, of, of hesitancy and qualification and conditionality. That's in a way a story about states trying to evade their responsibilities in relation to international criminal law. And these evasions have come home to roost a bit in Ukraine, where the enthusiasm for war crimes trials seems... Um, seems rather hard to swallow in the face of a complete lack of enthusiasm for, say, the ICC's 
investigations in Afghanistan and Palestine, or indeed much reference to the war of aggression that occurred in 2003 when the United States and the United Kingdom and Australia invaded Iraq. There really hasn't been much mention of that. So there's a fair degree, I don't want to get Freudian here, there's a fair degree of repression going on in, in, in relation to Ukraine and its historical antecedents and avatars. Might be a bit of uh, international crime schizophrenia there. <laughs> Um, it, it, it's interesting on that note that, uh, that both Republicans and Democrats in the U.S. have now struck a deal over a draft bill that would expand the uh, 1996 war crimes law to give American courts jurisdiction over uh, cases involving atrocities committed abroad, even if neither party is a U.S. citizen. So, um, that, uh, I mean, we, we're seeing the, the evolution also of of, uh, of, of jurisdiction, international jurisdiction also, or universal jurisdiction rather, in, in, in front of us um, as, as this war continues. And let's go back to Doug also. Um, Doug, can you distinguish for us between cultural and physical genocide and, and talk to us about those aspects in relation to the Russia-Ukraine war? Thank you. No, I, I think that um, Gary brought up a lot um, I like the idea of the dialectic. Um, I think that's a that's a fantastic way of looking at the tensions in international criminal law. Um, it throws us back into the politics of it, um, and there's there's also there's also a, a dialectic there between the ideals and the political realities as they exist, um, which also exists in relationship to to how you view international criminal law through through a sense of who's, who, who's the victim and who's the aggressor. And am I being, am I, am I, my group, my nation, my people, my state, my government being the one prosecuted. So it can collapse real quickly into an us versus them kind of dynamic, which cuts against the very purpose of international criminal law in the first place. And I think that that tension is very important to, to call out and to, to, and to realize. Um, if we don't realize it, then we un then all of a sudden international criminal law becomes just a tool of state power and manipulation of elites that elites can use to manipulate um, politics towards their advantage. Um, I think I think there's an aspect here where um, where if we're going to sort of grapple with this, we we realize that it's sort of baked into the cake um, in a lot of ways. This is a 20th century sort of history of international criminal law. And one aspect of that is the very question that, that was posed, which is, is there a difference between the cultural and the physical aspects of the crime of genocide? That distinction between cultural genocide and non-cultural genocide was created by U.S. diplomats. I mean, we have all the private papers that they were writing because the U.K. government declassified their intelligence on the Americans, right? <laughs> Fascinating. So, so we have those papers, right? And, and, the UK, and the American diplomats separated the two and created two different concepts of physical genocide and cultural genocide. And that was in order to exclude a whole raft of, of forced assimilation policies that the United States was committing against uh, all sorts of um, uh, ethnic and racial minorities and indigenous peoples. Um, and they, they said that very clearly. And so they create this distinction between the two and then that locks itself into the negotiating process. And then, and then different member states bring up this difference between physical and cultural genocide. And now you've got the idea that there are two types of genocide. And what's interesting of this is that Lemkin himself goes along with it. And this just, just does. Um, and starts talking about two different genocides. When his first definition of genocide, mass murder, was only one type of subsection of different types of physical ways of killing. He's talking about all sorts of different physical processes. Mass murder is only one. That's important because he coins the word genocide in 1941 in the winter, which is before the final solution, right? So, he's, so he goes from having this, this conception of genocide about the destruction of nations, where nations have these spirits and souls, which is highly problematic for our current understandings. Um, and it, that sort of catapults into this idea that genocide is mass murder. Um, and then therefore there's two different genocides. There's a cultural destruction and a mass murder one. So I think in international law, if you're talking about cultural destruction, you're going to find those protections in crimes against humanity, because crimes against humanity has expanded to include these forms of um, oppression. Um, I think I'm not so sure international law is going to be able to prosecute cultural genocide. It hasn't. I don't think that's going to be something that, that's sort of there. 
But I do think if we're talking about making sense of this conflict in terms of questions of peace and reconciliation and larger questions of justice, the justice that lies outside of the out of courts and tribunals, justice that rests in things like NGOs and memory organizations and things like in Cambodia, the documentation center, which exists parallel to the international courts, they're there to preserve memory, to collect testimony, to sort of be a museum. Then we can start to talk about the questions of cultural destruction that are sort of part and parcel of the of, of the, the, the murderous acts of genocide that emerge. Um, and I think that's, I think, I think in some ways you can sort of put them together in that sense. Um, the, the idea that you would commit physical genocide in a group presupposes that you see them as a as a sort of cultural social entity uh, in the first place. So I think they go hand in hand if we're talking sociologically. And, um, and, and so I would sort of take that question, I would, I would sort of throw that to the sociologists and the historians and the museum experts and the educators. And I'd say that, that that's, that's a place where you can find justice uh, and justice can be found. So that probably doesn't satisfy your answer, but, um, but that's the best that I can. No, I think I think it's a really important discussion to have, you know, especially because um, a lot of Ukrainians are talking about Russian colonialism, you know, and this idea of destroying a lot of cultural elements related to Ukraine and the Ukrainian nation and the Ukrainian people, um, you know, and, and you mentioned the word genocide that that Lemkin coined, right? Um, I mean, there's so much nuance with that word coming from the word uh, genos Greek a group of people and side, of course, you know, um, which which some people translate as killing, but it can also mean destruction, you know, and so it's not just the physical killing of people, of course, it's it's also the destruction of a people and uh, something that, that Lemkin, of course, as, as you know, much better than most people was quite obsessed with. Um, so it's, I, I do think it's, it's quite an interesting discussion that 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 um, we need to have in relation to this conflict. Let, let's turn um, again, you know, to uh, uh, Gary. Um, what is the likelihood that Ukrainians will ever see justice for Putin's crimes committed in Ukraine? And what are the risks, would you say, of launching, uh, let's say, uh, an international tribunal at this point in relation to uh, possible peace settlements? Thank you. Yeah, um, good questions. I just I just go back to something Doug said. I mean, he's absolutely right that the problem we have at the moment really is partly so. This is one of the dangers in answer to your last question. I mean, one of the dangers is that we end up with a very narrow and compromised idea of what justice actually is. So that the, the relentless focus on uh, war crimes trials and crimes against humanity and punishing one person in the Kremlin. Um, could end up being a bit of a distraction from richer and more sort of plural forms of, of, of justice. So, for example, you know, the effort to say, you know, rehabilitate um, Ukraine, the need for at least some form of negotiation at the end of this war, the, the sense of uh, some kind of merciful outcome on both sides, that kind of diplomatic talk might be severely inhibited by this constant and slightly obsessive reference to war crimes, international courts, criminal courts, and punishment. And at the moment, I, my impression is that we are in the middle of a bit of a, a war ourselves, or a debate about the war between um, what I call punishers and negotiators. Um, and I think that the punishers are winning out, uh, though that may change in the coming weeks. But at the moment, the relentless focus is on the punishment of Vladimir Putin with all the kind of individualistic problems that poses for us and our concepts of justice and responsibility, but also to you know, punish the Russian state and the Russian people and indeed Russian cultural forms. So this seems to be a very, very heavy handed uh, punitive regime where we're you know, canceling Tchaikovsky and Chekhov on Netflix or at the Cardiff Symphony Orchestra or we're banning Russian tennis players from Wimbledon or we're talking as the French foreign minister did uh, when sanctions were introduced about destroying the Russian economy. 
Um, to me, this form of punitiveness is both cruel and dangerous. Um, to destroy the economy of a major power in possession of thousands of nuclear weapons hardly seems like rational, rational politics. So sometimes international criminal law, for all its virtues, gets recruited on the side of the of the punishers. And I would make a similar plea to Doug for a sort of more rounded sense of justice. And, and, and this is the sort of thing that I hope that the negotiators, as I'm calling them, will, will take up when it comes to thinking about a question that I'm, rather strangely hasn't been thought about very much. Namely, how exactly is this going to end without the destruction of the Ukrainian state? Um, because as far as I can tell, both Ukra the Ukraine and the United States end game seems to involve the destruction of Ukraine. Um, there is, I mean, I, I heard Hillary Clinton talk about it, the, the idea of sort of turning Ukraine into a kind of Afghanistan that bleeds Russia dry. But, but, but you know, we've only just finished destroying the first Afghanistan. It seems too early to, to create another one. So I think we need to really think about this sort of relationship between between negotiation and um, punishment. There's a very good essay, um, one of the first essays that has taken this up in the uh, sort of general media in the New York Times, uh, New York uh, Book Review this, uh, this month by Fintan O'Toole, the Irish writer called, uh, it's called Our Hypocrisy on War Crimes that takes up some of these questions related to the politics of war crimes prosecutions. And, you know, to, to, to go back to something Doug said, a lot of war crimes law is about both including and excluding crimes and injuries. So part of it looks as if it's about bringing as many acts into the general category of criminality as possible by expanding the field, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes. But at almost every point in history, there's been a parallel effort to narrow jurisdiction or narrow the substance of the crime or simply remove some states from the jurisdiction of certain crimes. That's been the story of the International Criminal Court. It was the story of Nuremberg and Tokyo. Think of the way the nuclear attacks on Nagasaki and Hiroshima were, were, were excluded from consideration that in, in Tokyo. That's the most obvious example, but one can think of literally dozens of examples of this. So this goes back to my sort of two parallel fields. Now, O'Toole talks about the problem of war crimes prosecutions over the last, say, you know, 70 or 80 years and sort of refers back to, the, to an ideal, a idealized and universalist ambition at the heart of the field. But I think what we have to ask ourselves is which of these represents the true face of international criminal law? Um, like so many people, for a great many years, I've always thought of international criminal law as fundamentally a justice project dedicated to the universal um, prosecution of those um, who commit war crimes and crimes against humanity and the consolation of victims who are, the, um, who are, who are injured by these crimes. Um, but increasingly, if one looks at the concrete circumstances in which international criminal law is um, performed, and activated, uh, one might well conclude that international criminal law is a sort of um, organized form of injustice. And while it's important to keep the idealized vision in mind as a hor horizon of possibility, I think I'd be more inclined to study the concrete circumstances in which war crimes prosecutions have been very, very asymmetrically um, um, pursued over the last uh, over the last three quarter century. So basically, uh, uh, international law could become a matter of a political football, basically, <laughs> in short. Um, but I, I think you're also uh, uh, alluding to the issue of the the whole peace versus justice dilemma. This this idea that victims want some form of justice, but there is also negotiations happening at the same time, uh, which, which could make matters quite complicated. But of, of course, you know, uh, one of the big factors that I think you've also hinted at is this issue, how the facts on the ground in terms of the war could also dictate what type of, of justice we would see, if any, at the end of the day. Um, now, Doug, I'm going to come back to you with a, with a very kind of, uh, with a question that, that I think warrants a very nuanced answer also, because this is quite a complicated matter. In places like Kharkiv, uh, 
Putin's troops have committed major atrocities and some might even argue acts of genocide. Uh, Kharkiv, like many other Ukrainian cities, are predominantly populated by Russian speakers and ethnic Russians. Can you still make the argument that Putin's troops are committing genocide in those places? Yeah, I, I think one of the great misfortunes of international criminal and ad hoc applications of the of genocide law has been to to reach this, this idea that one group cannot commit genocide against their own group. Um, it's sort of implied in the idea of genocide is the destruction of ethnic, national, racial, and um, uh, religious groups. It sort of it can be read as implying, but but this this recreates this old idea that the human beings are divided into mutually exclusive groups, and that none of us have multiple identities, multiple allegiances. I mean, you know, there's these sociologists have done fantastic jobs on St. Patrick's Day in the United States, and you do a poll on ethnicity. There, are, there would be, according to these polls, more Irish people living in the United States than in Ireland. Um, but then you do it one week later, and all of a sudden the Irish population drops. So our, so our understandings of who we are as human beings is constantly changing to base, depending on our context and our life and so forth. And it just seems like a little bit absurd to me, for instance, that the Cambodian tribunal said that genocide was only committed against, you know, people who are not ethnically Khmer. So, you know, I can imagine, I can imagine sort of a genocide prosecution emerging that says, well, you know, all those Russian speakers who Russian troops killed, those aren't genocide. And I would just shrug my shoulders and say, oh, it's just, that's, that's unfortunate. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I, I want to sort of come back and sort of emphasize that part, which is that, you know, th that, that notion that there are these distinct groups that are mutually exclusive histories is part of the ideology of a lot of genocidal regimes in the first place. Uh, it's how that's, you know, I mean, this is, this is sort of implied in the idea that you would destroy a cultural group, um, sort of implies that, that we don't have mixed heritages, we don't have mixed identities, we don't have mixed stories. Uh, our categorizations and our coding for our identity groups, whoever they are, however they are, um, somehow doesn't allow for uh, mixtures, which I think is, um, I, I really would wish international law wouldn't replicate these dynamics, and these, these aspects. Um, you know, there, there's a part of this is also loops back into um, what Gary was talking about with negotiations and ideas of injustice that merge. Can you imagine the hellish politics that would emerge 10, 15 years from now in Russian society if you have Western sanctions that destroyed the Western, that destroyed the Russian economy, collapsed and hurt most important, most, most, hurt most poor and middle class Russians, right? And then to have their national elites who were defending them against the West, according to that narrative, um, prosecuted for genocide in a Western backed tribunal, right? You are creating the recipe for the very ideologies that are fueling this conflict in the first place. That there is a distinction between this sort of, you know, sort of Eurasian cultural group, and that's different than the West. And, and Russian Orthodoxy is different than, than Catholic and Protestant churches. And that Ukraine is sort of getting all confused with its identity. And it really doesn't have an identity of its own. It's just politics and Western interference, right? If you, if you, if you led, if you had a situation where, where the, entire, the entire state, the people who live in that state were impoverished, their leaders prosecuted as genocidal, right? That you, you're, you're sort of setting the stage for the Putin elite to sort of justify to Russian people that, look, we told you they were evil not to get us from the very beginning. And that's something that's really, really important in the politics of genocide because genocidal elites and people who are looking to create cleavages between an us and a them oftentimes provoke attacks upon their own populations. And this is a very, very effective way of rallying people behind an elite leader. So I think, I'm not saying that Putin has provoked Western, <laughs> maybe he has, but I think he kind of did that accidentally. Um, but nevertheless, the point is, is that any of these kinds of attacks that are taking the frame of, of preventing Russians from attending uh, tennis you know, tournaments, uh, canceling Russian ballet, all of these sort of, these sort of, these, these, these group oriented attacks against Russians is somehow inherently evil, just fuels into the polarization and ends up recreating the very dynamics of the conflict 
um, that were there in the first place. And I really, really would hope and wish international criminal law wouldn't do the same thing um, by thinking in these sort of these very basic terms that human beings can be divided between mutually exclusive groups. So can he be prosecuted for genocide against ethnic speaking Russians? I hope so, right? I hope so. I think I would, I believe so. Um, but a lot of, a lot of the, the practice of law um, in recent years hasn't gone that way. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, Gary, if you, if you have anything uh, to add to that, you're welcome to, to add. I'm just gonna, I'm ask you another question also. Um, now, US President Biden, as well as a number of parliaments from countries like Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have used the word genocide to describe some of the acts being committed by Russia and Ukraine. Now, the, the Genocide Convention, of course, uh, obligates states to, to um, act in order to uh, try to stop genocide uh, if, if, if it is happening in a particular um, uh, country. Now, the, the Genocide Convention, of course, is, is very vague in terms of what it prescribes, what we should do to stop genocide, right? Um, now, in the Western world, we've instituted uh, economic sanctions against Russia. For example, we provided military aid and so on. But, but are those, can those things be interpreted as acting to stop genocide, for example, if once we've triggered it? I mean, I don't know if I would approach the question of sanctions from that perspective. In fact, uh, whether the Genocide Convention mandates some sort of response or not, feels to me slightly beside the point. I think, I think the danger with legal instruments is that they might produce a feeling that we have to choose one or other political outcome to what is a very, very difficult diplomatic problem. So that even if the Genocide Convention insisted, say, on military intervention to prevent you know, genocide within a certain place, which it clearly doesn't, by the way, um, but even if it did, I would hesitate to invoke it in this particular case. I mean, there are a million strategic, um, moral and political issues that arise when one thinks about the enforcement of a no-fly zone or the um, Swedish application to join NATO or some more powerful uh, intervention by NATO short of or not short of armed intervention. Those all seem to me to be questions largely of, of politics and morality, um, and indeed democracy rather than law. And the references to war crimes and Ukraine's territorial integrity and political independence, while you know understandable, could also, again, lead us down the wrong path to kind of non-negotiable outcomes that result in more deaths than we would have otherwise. So I think we have to be a little bit, a little bit careful about investing too much authority and power um, in legal instruments. I mean, on the likelihood of, of someone actually standing trial in, in so, somewhere or other, it's almost inevitable that someone will. Um, you know, somebody generally does get tried. Even in the Vietnam War, Lieutenant Kali was tried back in the United States. There were war crimes trials in Bangladesh. We know they've had them in Cambodia. Um, you know, even the Germans prosecuted people on their own side. Um, for acts of criminality on the Eastern Front, which was one big act of criminality after, after all. So there are all sorts of, sort of perverse outcomes here. But what you notice looking back over the history of international criminal law is that it is a bit of a law of the unexpected or a law of unintended consequences. People end up on trial even when you think they won't. So with the Yugoslav war crimes trials, I think most people thought no one would stand trial. And then when the few people did, they thought, that, well, Milosevic won't and uh, Karadzic won't and Mladic won't. Then they ended up on trial. No one thought General Pinochet would end up before the House of Lords on, a, on an extradition hearing. No one thought Adolf Eichmann would end up in, on trial in Israel. So stranger things have happened, but it, it seems neither likely nor especially desirable for the reasons that Doug gave, to have Vladimir Putin on trial in The Hague right now. One, one can't really see a good outcome there 
Um, and indeed the threat to hold him responsible for war crimes may be having also some perverse consequences in Russian civil society and amongst the Russian elite. So it's hard to know how these things play out, but I always go back to Judith Schlar, the American political philosopher who said that you know, legalism is a, is, a, is a choice of means. It's a political strategy. It has to be understood as a politics. To go back to your first question, it's, it's you know, the, what are the politics of war crimes trials? Well, war crimes trials are a politics. They're a form of politics. They're a decision. They're a decision to think about this war or not in religious terms, strategic terms, moral terms, literary terms, sentimental terms, but in terms of law and in terms of criminality. And at the moment, as I say, we're in this sort of punitive phase where international criminal law appears to be very, very important, but it can be rather quickly marginalized as well when other political imperatives um, flow through. And at that point, sometimes international criminal lawyers feel as if they've been left or cut adrift. And this project that seems so important, seemed to have universalist aspirations, turns out to be just one more left behind um, political uh, failure. Thank you on that bleak note. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a very optimistic note to end. No, no not, not at I all. Say, I, if it had been the last, if I'd known it was going to be the last thing I said, I'd have said something much more much more. No, 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 I no, no, we, we're not, we're not done yet. Uh, I, I, I was just, I was just thinking about your poor um, students, you know, who sign up for, uh, <laughs> you know, your international law lectures and then come to the quick conclusion that international law uh, is not always um, as, as strong as it ought to be. They, um, they, they emerge as chastened idealists. That's what I always say. Chas chastened utopians. That's the idea. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds appropriate. Um, all right, Doug, let's go back to you. Uh, now, you made the argument quite early on that Western power should support a war crimes tribunal along the lines of, of the Eichmann trial. Um, would, would you care to collaborate, uh, to elaborate on that? Thank you. Yeah, I um, back to sort of the, the bleak ending. I just I just finished editing a book with like you know fifteen chapters about how people who try to build peace and resolve conflicts uh, make things worse. And I did that before I had tenure. So you know, <laughs> there's something very important um, about realizing the limitations of our own idealism, um, and I, we can very quickly become delusional in our hopes, and and that and that opens the door for all sorts of uh, Thing, unintended consequences that we really didn't mean to, to do, but we end up did doing them anyway. So I think I think I think the healthy skepticism is actually a moment of optimism because you, you, you have to be you have to be optimistic to be willing to sort of dig through your your skepticism. Um, so I you know about Eichmann I I wouldn't I don't want to I don't want to be on the record as saying Eichmann is my model right because I don't I don't think we want to be sending secret I don't think we want to be sending spies into Russia to capture Russians and bring them back um what I what I, I would I maybe, maybe I'd broaden this and say that I'm I've been really impressed by domestic prosecutions of international criminal law um and the more I read about them and the more I learn about them the more I begin to understand that like in Argentina um, and in fact, the first genocide conviction was 46 in the Polish Supreme uh, Tribunal, which was a domestic Polish tribunal that, that prosecuted genocide before the Nuremberg Tribunals picked up the term. Um, and what, this is a long history here of this. And I think um, in Canada can be included too with the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But the point is that those, those domestic tribunals that are taking these international crimes allow for the freedom for the, the jurists and the defense lawyers and the prosecutors and the judges and the national audiences to, to begin to try to make sense of what international law means in their context. And the Argentine jurists, I mean, came out and said, this, this definition of nationality that has recreated itself in international criminal law doesn't apply to Argentina. And, and they re, and that, in, in that act of reimagining, all of a sudden, it becomes um, much more flexible. And that flexibility actually has the ability to touch human rights movements, domestic movements, local people who are working in the context of peace building. So in, in, in Eichmann gets attached to whatever you think about Israeli sovereignty and Israeli politics and the Israeli state. Just put aside that and notice how Eichmann is crucial for the construction of Israeli sovereignty, Israel sovereignty in the first place. Right. 
And then look at Argentina and the way that those domestic prosecutions of genocide against the junta have really captured a local, local, low grassroots movements for peace and reconciliation of memory that the, that the machinations around the Pinochet trials did not in Chile. And I think, I think you see that in, Cam, um, in Cambodia, there's a that ad hoc tribunal is a little closer to the local people. Uh, you see that in Canada, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I really, I really think that the future of, in a very odd way, the future of international criminal law might actually rest in the way that it's understood and taken up by domestic uh, instruments, mechanisms, pick your, pick your synonym. Thank you. Let's turn uh, again uh, to Gary again. Um, I have some questions from the audience also. Uh, Ewan Grant is asking, how likely is it that Russia would take more hostages to deter prosecutions? Uh, we also have a question from Michelle Hughes, who's a PhD candidate at LSE, and she's noting that a lot of the discussion focused on the current conflict in Ukraine, but uh, she notes that, of course, if you look at uh, Russia's incursions in Afghanistan, Czechia, Czechia Syria, Georgia, all followed similar patterns. Um, so she's asking, is there a place for evidence of a pattern of criminal behavior in the analysis of crimes against humanity and or crimes of aggression? Thank you. Well, I mean, to go to, go to Michelle's point, um, which is a very, very good one, uh, it, it tends to be the case that the ICC approaches situations, just to, to, to think about the International Criminal Court for a moment, rather than states. So it looks, at, it looks at particular situations like Afghanistan, Iraq, Ukraine. It doesn't consider the behavior of um, states themselves so much. So we might say that Nuremberg, and this is a brand new thought to me, so I might get it completely wrong, that Nuremberg really thought about criminality around the German state and what the German state was doing, whereas the ICC tends to think about the locus of criminality. So to think about, say, Russian responsibility for systematically criminal warfare across Georgia, um, Ukraine, and elsewhere would probably be outside the jurisdiction of the ICC but it's a it's a provocative thought I should just say on the, on that subject that the uh, European Society of International Law issued a statement about the uh, Ukraine war more or less asking scholars to be very very wary about using historical comparators in other words placing the Ukraine war in its historical context which seemed to me to be a slightly crazy thing for an academic body to say i mean it was a, in a way a, a, a bit of sort of what about or, or a rejection of what what about i can't remember which it is but i don't really care for the term in the first place and i particularly do care for the need to put things in their historical context in order to understand the causes of things as they say at the lsc so so i i i I'm, I'm very much with michelle on the idea but i have doubts about whether it would be jurisdictionally possible given the current regime of international criminal law. Uh, will the Russians take hostages? I think there are a few things in the Russian locker, to say the least. Um, gas supplies going westwards, hostages I hadn't really thought of, you know, further nuclear threats. I don't think Putin is a madman. Uh, a lot of intelligent observers have had long conversations with him in which he has spoken very intelligently about global politics. I mean, clearly he has become less rational, I think, over the years. So again, there's disagreement about, about that. But I would certainly stand by the idea that he's capable of making and continues to make somewhat rational decisions in relation to the Ukraine war, the withdrawal from um, Kiev, the slight cranking back of nuclear threats, the quite subtle threats in relation to Finnish and Swedish applications for membership of NATO, you know, unspecified consequences. Um, sounds quite, um, quite diplomatic compared to some of the things that Western leaders are saying about, as I say, destroying the Russian economy or describing Putin as a war criminal before there was much evidence of war crimes taking place in Ukraine. So, um, yeah, I think we need to be a bit, I think we need to be aware that, that there are lots of ways that this could play out. Some of them are, are, are very dangerous and the Russians have some stuff in their locker as well as us. 
Thank you. Our final question uh, to you, Doug, uh, and you can just give a sentence or two reply. I mean, this, uh, but but I think it's 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 interesting posing this question. Uh, you know, Ukraine and Russia are, are not members of the Rome Statute, of course, um, but but of, but Ukraine uh, gave permission to the ICC to open up investigations in Ukraine. Um, now, can uh, the, 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 the ICC, of course, is theoretically an independent body, but there is also a delicate relationship uh, with the UN Security Council. Now, can the UN Security Council stop a case once the ICC starts its investigation? And, and if so, you know, uh, um, should we then still invest resources in, in the ICC if, if, if Russia is able to block ICC investigations in, in Ukraine? Well, I mean, the question about the, the Security Council kind of blocking investigations that are already underway, that's, from my understanding of it, that's, you know, this, maybe I get yelled at by a whole bunch of people later. Um, yes, because politics can always rule the day at the Security Council. Um, and I think, I think you could so in one hand, there's the legal question, which will be fought over and debated, but then there's the political question, which somehow subsumes the, the, the legal one and, and leads to the legal outcome that fits the interests of the people who are there, the parties that are there. Um, you know, I, is, is ICC worth pursuing and supporting? You know, I would, I would like to see um, the US government, instead of declaring the right to prosecute anybody in the world for anything, um, sign up to the ICC as a full member Right, it's full signatory. I think that would be, I think that's that's the you know that's the kind of reciprocity and equality under the law that I think would be necessary to make the ICC to stabilize its future. Um, and you know, I think I think I think the ICC is worth investigating, in, even for all the additional processes that it sort of allows to take hold wherever you know it is in the world. It anchors really really important conversations in civil society, politics, and and it brings in a lot of victims groups and it brings in a lot of different questions of reconciliation and restitution that wouldn't have political space, social space outside of that. And it does it under the sort of the language of the law, which is an important metaphor for our time. So I think that's important. Um, back to sort of the, the Michelle's question and you know what, what Gary was getting at there. I do, I do sort of shake my head at the idea that, um, that, that the, the biases, the long, long, long biases are still at play in terms of why now in Ukraine is the United States and Western Europe all of a sudden, you know, really angry at, at Russian war crimes. Well, one is because it's a little closer to NATO, sure, but, the, but you can't escape, you cannot escape the long, long, long sort of um, biases that, that exist in terms of how the Western Europe and the United States sort of constructs itself as an identity group. Um, you start saying names like Chechnya, Syria, Georgia, and you're talking about a lot of a lot of a lot of Muslim communities in the Caucasus in the Middle East. Um, you're talking a lot about who's refugee, what kind of refugees are going to start coming to Europe? Um, who do we care about? Who do we not care about? And I think those are on full display in a very very sad way. Um, and and that that's unfortunate because it actually undermines a lot of the questions of justice for Ukraine today. Um, in, in, a, in a very interesting way. So I think, um, so Michelle, I think, I think it's sad that, that those conversations uh, tend to drop out um, of, of these conversations.